Okay. Uh, I will attempt to live up to that very <laughs> kind introduction. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I'm John Turner, uh, and I'm going to be giving a topic lecture. Okay, that, that means that I want to try and outline to you some of the features of the topic that you'll be debating. Okay? And one of the challenges of a lecture like this is some of you are arriving at debate camp, and uh, this is really your, fir this is your first time talking about debate. Okay, so before I get into any of my material, I want to outline a couple things about you know, what to expect in terms of debate camp and some advice then for listening to this lecture and some of the other information that you'll receive. Okay, so first, I hope that everybody has something out for taking notes. Okay, everybody have something to take notes on. Yes? Okay. Two, not only are you going to be taking notes, you're going to be taking notes on a lecture that's going to be almost two hours long. Okay? I suspect for most of you that that's a bit longer than you're used to for receiving densely packed information. I'm going to build in some breaks. I'm going to build in some time for questions and all that. Okay, but I'm asking for what I understand is a lot of concentration. Why do we do it that way? Okay? First, every part of debate camp is part of training for debate. Okay? Debate rounds that you have in high school are not quite two hours long, but they're at least an hour and a half. Okay? So working on listening and concentrating for this period of time, a lot of complex information, a lot of arguments, basically, that you're keeping track of, that's part of your training for debate. We're not in lab right now, but you should treat this lecture as part of learning that set of skills that involves keeping track of detailed information, that involves treating things as structured arguments, because that's the way that I'm going to try and present some of this material. Okay? Two, questions are permitted and, in fact, in some ways encouraged. Okay? I'll, like I said, try and build in some uh, periods to answer questions. But go ahead and raise your hand if I'm moving too fast, if there's something that you feel like you need clarified. Okay? I can't guarantee that I'll answer every question as it's asked. Right? I might try and move something uh, to a different period or you know, t I'll say, oh, I think I'm going to talk about some of that information later in the lecture. Right? So, that's not me being rude, that's me trying to stick to my kind of organizational plan. Okay? So, with that in mind, I want to move to the topic lecture. Okay? Purpose. The purpose of the topic lecture. I I'm not going to give you a detailed breakdown of anticipated strategies on this topic, because there's a large number of you that don't really understand yet what debate strategy entails. <laughs> you don't know anything about debate. Okay? But I'm going to try and connect a number of the themes that I'm talking about, okay, some, some of the overall themes that I've found in researching domestic surveillance, which is our topic, to the material that you'll see in your files and some of the arguments that you'll talk about in your labs. Okay, so this is, the lecture is intended to give you an overview kind of conceptually about surveillance rather than a like detailed set of things about this is exactly what we'll be arguing about with the evidence that you'll be getting later in your labs. Okay? So, first, what is our topic? What is our resolution? Uh, it is as follows. The United States federal government, the United States federal government should substantially curtail, substantially curtail its domestic surveillance. Its domestic surveillance. There are a couple important features about this topic that you might notice right away. Okay, first, we're dealing with the federal government. And its surveillance. So not surveillance in general, but surveillance that's done by agencies of the federal government. Okay? That's likely to include at least the following. The FBI, okay? the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The NSA, the National Security Agency. The CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay? And DHS, or the Department of Homeland Security. Okay? FBI, NSA, CIA, and Department of Homeland Security are all agencies that at different times okay, are responsible for conducting surveillance on behalf of the federal government. Raising our next question, what is surveillance? Okay. I want to give you 
what is a, a long definition, but one that I think gets at a number of the important components of surveillance. And this is from uh, Gary Marks. He's a professor of sociology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, probably known to you as MIT. Okay? And he's a prominent scholar in the area of surveillance, and he's discussing the ways in which people who, who research surveillance are trying to keep up with changes in the field. Okay? Surveillance has changed a lot over the past couple decades because there have been very significant technological changes, and surveillance is strongly related to technology. Okay? That definition will get into this. And I'm going to use that to talk a little bit about some of the components of surveillance. Okay? So here's his definition. He's going to explain why he's trying to define surveillance differently. Okay. One indicator of rapid change is the failure of dictionary definitions to capture current understandings of surveillance. Okay. For example, in the concise Oxford Dictionary, surveillance is defined as, quote, close observation, especially of a suspected person. Okay. So this is the, he's characterizing this as the sort of classic or old definition. Okay. Close observation of a suspected person, okay? Think of any police or crime drama that you've ever seen, right? If you've, raise your hand if you've seen a scene with a stakeout, right? It's like somebody's watching, it's like maybe you watched Homeland, some, you know, FBI, whatever, okay? They're staking out, they're watching somebody who's a suspect, okay? That's the classical definition of surveillance. I get assigned a specific task to watch you, okay, or some some particular individual, somebody who we think needs to be watched because they think they're going to commit a crime. They might uh, we need information about them, okay. So saying that's the that's the classic definition, okay. He goes on. Yet today, many of the new surveillance technologies are not especially applied to a suspected person. So, no more one suspected person. No more one suspected individual. They are applied categorically, categorically, okay? The adjective form of a category, right? So instead of I'm watching you, an individual suspected person, I'm instead trying to gather information about a whole category of people of which you might be one potential representative, okay? So they're applied categorically. Surveillance is also applied to contexts, okay? Geographical places and spaces particular time periods, networks, systems, and categories of person, not just to a particular person whose identity is known beforehand. Okay, so you want to add to this list places, spaces, networks, okay? You might be trying to gather information, not about a particular person, okay, but about any of these things. So some examples of this. When we say that we might have a place that's under surveillance or a space that's under surveillance, okay, think about a closed circuit television camera, right? A security camera, okay? That's surveilling a place, not a person, right? Me being the, you know, I, I, as an individual, if I walk into that place, I'm now under surveillance, right? But that doesn't have anything to do with what the person who's doing the surveillance knows about me. That just has to do with that particular location, okay? That type of surveillance has expanded exponentially because we have things like video, okay? Video recording, digital recording, tape recording, all of these forms of keeping track of information, which if surveillance is about gathering information, right, that means that technologies that change how we gather and store information change surveillance, okay? Up until not all that long ago, it was actually really, really hard to keep track of and record information about a large set of people or a large set of places, right? Imagine if I'm trying to surveil a place, okay, back in the 1920s, like early in the history of the FBI, okay? I can't put a camera in that place, right? I have to assign a rotation of agents who just sit there, right, and they watch that place. And chances are, okay, if I just have one person sitting there watching, it's like watching this park, watching this, you know, it's like watching some location. People are going to figure that out, right? So I got to rotate. It's very complicated. If I'm going to if I'm going to conceal the fact that I'm gathering information about that place, it's super super difficult. Okay. Now I might be able to put a camera that's about this big, 
right, that can store on a drive that is attached to that camera several, you know, basically several hundred gigabytes of information. Enough video to keep track of that place for the whole day. No one would ever notice that camera. No one would understand that they're under surveillance. No one would understand that records are being kept about their movements or about the movements in that place. Okay? So when a scholar like this talks about the way in which surveillance has dramatically changed, okay, that there are new things that we need to keep, take into account, like places or spaces, okay, that's one of the examples. That's how, you know, instead of watching some particular individual, we're now talking about recording or gathering information on a much wider set of objects. Networks is in here too, right? We're going to be talking about this a lot over the course of camp, okay? <laughs> Most of you are carrying devices that are networked, right? How many of you are how many of you have a cell phone right now that you're that you're carrying? Okay. That cell phone, chances are, right, is connected to a cellular network. It's connected probably, or at least, you know, if you're technically competent, it's connected to Emory's wireless network, right? And those networks are also now capable of being placed under surveillance, right? People can keep track of the data, and I don't want to imply that this is all sinister, right? A lot of us rely on this kind of information, the type of information that's generated for surveillance in our daily lives, right? If I take out my phone and I use Google Maps, okay, what does my phone need to know in order for me to use Google Maps? Your location. It needs to know my location, right? That means that my location is being recorded and captured by a number of different entities, right? And that data is likely being stored by a bunch of those same organizations, right? It might be Google. It might be the internet service provider that I'm using when I log into my browser, okay? And so different networks and devices that we use are now also oftentimes thought of as being vulnerable to surveillance, okay, rather than a particular person. I want to continue with this definition. He says, this is Gary Marks again, the term close observation also fails to capture contemporary practices. Okay, so suddenly, not just not suspected person, but not even close observation. Okay? Surveillance may be carried out from afar, as with satellite images or the remote monitoring of communications and work. No need, uh, no, nor need it be as close as in detail. Much initial surveillance involves superficial scans looking for patterns of interest to be pursued in greater detail. Okay, so it could be from a distance. Could be looking for patterns, right? Rather than a lot of in-depth surveillance about one particular person, okay? So then he proposes his own definition, a better definition of the new surveillance. Okay. The new surveillance is the use of technical means to extract or create data. Use of technical means to extract or create data. He justifies this definition. Okay. This may now be taken from individuals or contexts. The use of technical means to extract and create information implies the ability to go beyond what is offered to the unaided senses or is voluntarily reported. Okay, so I'm trying to generate, trying to create information, not just record what is immediately obvious. Okay? The use of contexts along with individuals recognizes that much modern surveillance also looks at settings and patterns of relationships. Meanings may reside in cross-classifying discrete sources of data with computer matching and profiling that in and of themselves are not revealing. Systems as well as persons are of interest. So in addition to networks, here we have systems, right? All of this is a way of prefacing the fact that people who work in the area of surveillance in the academy, okay, people who do research in institutions like Emory, like MIT, Okay, the people who do this type of research are trying to call our attention to the fact that surveillance has undergone a dramatic shift. Okay? There are a host of new technologies, a host of new methods that are available to a variety of different agencies, not just the government, but in our cases we'll be sort of more interested in how the government does that type of surveillance. Okay? And that is part of the reason that I'm going to transition into now the question of why is it that we're debating this controversy right now, right? 
High school, high school coaches and teams across the country voted on a topic. Okay, voted on a topic for us to debate, and we chose to debate this topic about domestic surveillance. Why? Okay. Well, first, okay, first, I think that this whole change in our society in terms of technical means, a bunch of the stuff that I just went over from that definition, that's part of why we're debating this controversy now. Most of the people who made this decision or a bunch of the people who contributed, like your coaches, okay, they tend to be a bit older, like myself. Okay? <laughs> we did not grow up in an era of digital communication. I didn't get a cell phone until after I graduated college, partly because I'm a technophobe, but also because I'm old. Okay? I, when I arrived on my college campus, okay, I had never heard of wireless. They installed a wireless network while I was in college, and I remember thinking, why would we ever need this? They, it's like, why would we ever use I have a computer right here at my desk. What am I going to do? Use my computer outside? What is this? Okay. A bunch of the people who are older than you okay, see you using these technologies. They become an integral part of your lives and a part of our lives. And I think a lot of us feel like there is something inherently controversial okay, and interesting about the introduction of this set of material into our life. Okay? The fact that most of you probably record huge amounts of information, video, pictures, etc., you post it to social networks, okay, that may occur with or without the supervision of your parents, right? It's like our society has experienced an explosion of data, okay, and surveillance is about the pursuit of information. So if our society is generating that much more data, okay, it's bound to generate some controversy. And part of that is informed by the idea, I think, that some of the older people around you are, at the very least, interested and potentially intimidated by some of these changes. And they want you to debate that set of changes so that you're making choices about it rather than simply doing that unconsciously or without thinking about it. Okay. Second, okay, so if, that's, if technological change and some of these changes in our society are driving why this controversy now, the second thing I would say is, okay, there is a huge current events controversy surrounding the issue of government surveillance. Okay? I'll play a video clip here in a minute, but I want to ask some questions first and, and start off with an observation. This is the most current events driven high school debate topic that I've seen or coached on in a long time. Okay? That is, the, the information about this topic is likely to change on a daily or weekly basis as you debate it. Okay? There are debates in Congress going on right now about the scope of government surveillance. Okay, that's pretty different than most of the topics that we've researched. And part of the way that that, I just, you know, to give you a little bit of background information, right, I, my job is to coach debate. So I do a lot of debate research. I spend a lot of time gathering materials for presentations like this one and arguments that our team makes. Okay? When I started gathering information for this presentation, for this topic, for uh, teaching you all in lab, Okay. I was astounded by the fact that I had to go back to using almost entirely what I would think of as journalistic sources. Okay. New newspaper, internet, daily, you know, daily journalism. Right? Rather, I like to spend my time in the library among, among a bunch of books that were written you know, a decade ago, <laughs> spend my time sort of carefully combing through a lot of very abstract, you know, sort of thoroughly researched data. This topic has some of that. But it has a lot of information that's going to change really rapidly. And I think in some ways that'll be very interesting for all of us, right? It'll, be, it'll encourage us to keep track of what's going on in this controversy at all times, okay? Now, my set of questions before I play my video clip, okay? How many of you know who Edward Snowden is? Raise your hands. Okay, so nearly everyone, okay? Nearly everyone. For those of you who don't, you, you will soon, okay? But next question, okay? I want to, and I just, I want a couple samples here. We don't need, you know, all 100 of you saying this all at once. But where did you first find, where did you first, you know, you say you know who Edward Snowden is. Where did you first encounter that information? How did you first hear about who he was? Yeah. On the news. On the news. Uh, on, on TV? Yeah. Okay. Um, the home page of my internet browser, it's Yahoo. Okay, so Yahoo News? 
people talking about it at school. Okay, people talking about it at school. Uh, uh, CNN.com. CNN.com. Okay, another internet user. Somebody else? <laughs> yeah. Teacher. Your teacher. Okay. So, the reason, part of the reason I take this sampling, okay, I don't think we would be having this topic if it weren't for Edward Snowden. There's, there's, I, I don't see any way that it would have happened, okay? This, he's an incredibly controversial figure, and he has raised a debate about surveillance in the United States that has reached a volume and a level of interest, okay, that I can sample a set of, you know, 100 plus, admittedly, probably very well informed, super interesting, very smart high school kids who I'm excited to teach, but, but essentially all of you know about him, okay? It's a very visible controversy. Okay. And I'm going to play a video clip from him now uh, that sort of gets at some of why I think this is, you know, such a such a such a prominent prominent controversy. Oops, sorry, opening the wrong browser. Uh, this, is, this, this is where this is where we get into some of my technical inabilities. So you'll have to bear with me. But here we are. So here's a, can everybody, everybody, I assume everybody can see this even with the lights on. Okay, so here's a clip of Edward Snowden discussing government surveillance. But about how the American surveillance state actually functions. It, uh, does it target the actions of Americans? Uh, NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can, by any means possible, that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now, increasingly, we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system, and it filters them, and it analyzes them, and it measures them, and it stores them for periods of time, simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, be intending to uh, target someone associated with a foreign government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything. But I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly have the authorities to, to wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president, if I had a personal email. One of the extraordinary parts about this episode is that usually whistleblowers do what they do anonymously and take steps for remaining anonymous for as long as they can, which they hope often is forever. You, on the other hand, have decided to do the opposite, which is to declare yourself openly as the person behind these disclosures. Why did you choose to do that? I, I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. When you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And if you do that in secret, consistently, you know, as the government does uh, when it wants to benefit from that secret action that it took, uh, it'll kind of give its, its officials a mandate to go, hey, you know, tell the press about this thing and that thing. So the public is on our side. But they rarely, if ever, do that when an abuse occurs. That falls to uh, individual citizens, but they're typically maligned. You know, it, it becomes a thing of these people are against the country or against the government. But I'm not. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happening, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. How do you get? OK. So I want us to, I'm, I'm going to talk for a minute about some of the information contained in that clip. I hope everybody's taking notes of the clip as well. That's debate evidence, 
right? <laughs> you, you, you are watching evidence, uh, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's a little strange, this is the first time I've ever used a video clip in a lecture that I give at debate camp. Once again, a bit of a technophobe, okay? But it's, it's strange to me that the nature of evidence is changing as well, right? This is also a scene in the uh, award-winning, uh, Academy Award-winning documentary this year, okay? Uh, uh, Citizen Four. And something to reflect on there, I think, some important aspects that reflect on our controversy. One, however you feel about what has happened, okay, I think that we are charged with that goal or that mission that Snowden ended that question with, which is that we are invited to debate about surveillance. We live in a democratic society, okay, we are now we have information available to us that we did not before. Whether, whether or not you think that we should have that information is another thing, but we have information that's available to us that wasn't before, and we have been invited to debate about the limitations, okay, or p potential limitations that a democratic society ought to place on its surveillance capacity. Okay, so when I read you that text of the resolution, the United States federal government should substantially curtail its domestic surveillance. Okay, curtail here is just a fancy word for decrease or reduce. Okay, should reduce its domestic surveillance. Those of you on the affirmative, okay, and you'll put me on both sides, obviously, at different times when you're debating this. On the affirmative, you'll say, yes, we should place limitations on domestic surveillance. Okay, I suspect you will use many of a, a, a more in-depth version Okay, of a few of the arguments that you just heard from uh, America's most famous current whistleblower. Okay, <laughs> that there is a set of surveillance techniques that were being applied to foreign countries, intelligence agents, spies, basically. Okay, that are now being used in a massive form domestically. Most of our communications, as as he said, if we believe what he said, are collected by default. Okay, that is the assumption is. When you are transmitting information across a variety of the technological networks that you all said, right, when you raise your hand with your cell phone, your computer, etc., right, you all use this set of networks. You all use this set of technologies. That form of new surveillance is something that we are all dealing with collectively as a democratic society. Okay, that's the that's the spur or sort of the, the controversy that really gets us going in some ways here. Okay. The second thing to notice, okay, or, or something to reflect on, I think, as a way of introducing why this controversy, why right now. I, I've been watching and reading a lot of material about this in preparation for camp. And I gotta say, you know, I've been coaching debate for 13 years now, um, basically as long as some of you have been alive. Uh, and this is one of the, I'm, I'm a politically engaged person. I care about things deeply. I'm also a grumpy person. I tend to get angry about stuff very easily. Any of the people that I coach with or coach can tell you about this, but I gotta say, in some ways, this controversy has me more excited in terms of the teaching experience of camp than most of the controversies that I have taught in my career as a coach. Why? Because as a coach, I believe in democratic <coughs> argument, and my job is fundamentally connected to research and open information, okay? So, as a researcher, when I approach this set of questions, when I come to this material, I care deeply about whether or not and how our society makes decisions about information collection, information gathering, and information usage. And I suspect that a number of the people in the debate community that you'll have encounters with, your own coaches, your judges, etc., are likely to be inspired or, you know, sort of tied to that same set of questions. Okay? So, now, I want to move to the organizational structure that I'm going to use for the rest of the lecture, assuming I can find a dry eraser, okay? So we talked a little bit about the definition of surveillance, some of the basic concepts in our topic, okay? And now I'm gonna use four sort of themes, okay, to discuss the controversies surrounding domestic surveillance. Okay, theme one is going to be political violence. Political violence. I'll get into defining that in a moment. Theme two, we've already touched on each one of these in its own little way, but theme two is gonna be 
technological shifts. Theme three, value shifts. Right. Theme four is organizational politics and design. These all have overlapping components. Okay, I'm going to spend some time with each little theme, try and illustrate some connections as well. Okay, but. Those are the four sort of blocks of information that I'm going to use to communicate to you about this controversy. Okay, so first, political violence. Political violence. Okay, I start with political violence as a theme because a huge amount of this topic will be influenced by debates about the appropriateness of the use of surveillance to achieve two different types of goals. Okay. One, goals of national security, okay. national security. Two, goals of criminal justice, okay. criminal justice. National security and criminal justice inform most of the reasons why the government conducts surveillance. Okay. Now, the reason that I've used the heading political violence, okay, instead of just violence, okay, or, you know, <laughs> Things that, or you know, more generic label like things that are scary. <laughs> okay, the reason I'm talking about political violence, okay, and what and what do I mean by that? I mean the use of violence to achieve political ends. Okay, the use of violence to achieve political ends. Politics, and this is where you you, you might notice you're, you're likely to have a series of debates about definitions of key concepts, right? That's sometimes what we refer to it. It's at least a component of topicality debate, but it's also a component of all debate okay, that we'll have in this controversy is trying to define your concepts carefully. Politics, okay, is usually defined or classically defined as the sphere for organizing, okay, the, the sphere for organizing, the way we organize the operation of power and authority in a particular society. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. It's the sphere where we organize the operation of power and authority in our society. Okay, so if something is in the political sphere, it relates to questions of power and authority. Political violence then refers to violent means okay, that are used to assist or change how power is organized and distributed. Okay, political violence, the use of violent means okay, to assist or change how power and authority are organized. How is this related to surveillance? Surveillance, okay, for those national security and criminal justice goals, okay, usually involves finding out who how and whether to punish or potentially even kill opponents of the state, right? When we talk about national security goals and criminal justice goals and their relationship to surveillance, okay, in order to successfully punish people or to identify security threats, people generate information. That information, okay, that's the process of surveillance. Right? We're talking about identifying who and how. Okay? how. How do we apply means of violence? Right? If I think that you should go to jail, okay, and, right, or, or our government thinks that you should go to jail, it's doing some. It's organizing the use of violence. It's organizing the use of punishment. Okay, and it uses information to do that. Right? If you end up in a courtroom, there's going to be a set of evidence that would be presented against you. Okay. How is that evidence gathered? How is it produced? Some of it will be through means of surveillance. Okay? So that's what I mean when I say that surveillance is connected to national security, criminal justice, and thus has to be connected to political violence. Okay, someone had their hand raised. Sorry, I wanted to. Yeah. So you're saying that surveillance is 
Yeah, I, yes, that in many ways, right, if our society says that there are threats to national security and that there are threats to public order, okay, criminals, right, surveillance is a capacity that's used by the government to identify people who are in both of those groups. So in many ways, it's about using or you know, creating information that is then used to justify okay, or provide legitimacy for the application of violent means. Right? If I want to punish you, or you know, if uh, the, the CIA thinks that there should be a drone strike in uh, you know, a village in Yemen, right? that information is generated by surveillance. Okay? It's about the organization of power and also violence. Okay? But one thing that you might want to notice about that, or maybe this is part of what you're asking in your question, is political violence might also refer to the means that are used by opponents of a state. Right? Oftentimes, this is the way that um, we talk about the phenomenon of terrorism, okay? political terror, political violence. Right? It's the application or the use of violence and fear to generate political change, right? to change how power is distributed. So, according to those who are doing surveillance, okay, part of their rationale is that what, who they are surveilling or what they are surveilling, right, those places or spaces that we talked about earlier, okay, should be considered legitimate targets okay, because they're attempting to organize the use of violence against the state in the case of national security, right, organized, organized means of applying and using violence against a state or their threats to public order in the case of criminal justice. Okay? It's like those threats to public order need to be punished. Okay? So surveillance, according to those who are doing it, right, it's about organizing and trying to find the information to ident identify justifiable and legitimate targets for the application of violence. Okay? There is a strong tension, a strong tension that runs throughout the history of this country Okay, in terms of surveillance and its relationship between, or the relationship between information, power, and the larger population. Okay? And that tension, okay, sort of a fundamental theme for our topic as it relates to political violence and organizing our society, organizing our politics, is the tension between liberty and security. Liberty and security. Okay. To talk about this historically a little bit, okay, I want you to think about the political principles that the country that you live in is founded on. Okay. The politically found the politically powerful founders of our society, okay, many of whom were quite wealthy, basically all of whom were men, uh, and basically all of whom were white in terms of those who were politically powerful, okay, were the leaders of an armed rebellion against a constitutional monarch. Okay. <laughs> they had a set of political disagreements with their larger society that grew so strong that they organized a bunch of <coughs> armed forces okay, and said, your government no longer exercises legitimate authority over us. We're going to govern ourselves. And we could and we will have a lot of debates about their understandings of liberty and its relationship to violence. I don't want to imply it's like, oh, okay, liberty, that's, they're all about liberty, <laughs> nothing else, but just as a theme for talking about surveillance, okay, we can agree that they regard it as fundamental, okay, fundamental to the political constitution of their society, a number of civil liberties, civil liberties that were designed to protect people like themselves. Okay. <laughs> that last part that sort of qualifies the exercise of civil liberties a little bit, but we'll talk about that for now. Okay? They had just fought a war, a rebellion. Okay? They were people who defied authority using armed force. So I don't think it should be that much of a surprise to us that when it came to designing the constitution of our society, okay, they put in a number of protections or a number of concepts that implied Okay, or at least protected those who organized political dissent. Right? If you win a war and a rebellion, you don't generally 
take the next step of saying, well, everything that we did to do that is totally illegitimate. In fact, we should have been considered criminals. We were terrible people, <laughs> right? It's like, you just founded a new society. Okay, what do you do? Well, people who organize political dissent, they are political heroes, <laughs> right? They deserve all of the liberty that they need in order to express political differences, okay? They need liberty, okay, to organize their society the way that they want to, okay? That's why there are several important constitutional principles that are built in that are designed to protect the expression of political dissent, okay? Freedom of expression, speech, assembly, and the press, okay? Those are all designed to protect political organizations and expressions of dissent, okay? So, and another way of putting it, back in our you know, sort of colonial context, white, uh, white male property owners wouldn't be prosecuted okay, for having religious beliefs that differed from those empowered, and they shouldn't be uh, prevented from assembling to generate political disagreement and change. And they would enjoy civil liberties. Other protections that were included, protection from illegitimate search and seizure. Right? If I'm organizing a conspiracy, if I, if I just want a rebellion in which I organized a conspiracy against my government, okay, uh, basically, I'm going to generally probably assign some protections okay, to those who might be searched to find out whether or not they're loyal to the government. Right? Like if I'm going to find out whether or not you're hiding you know, your musket or whatever in your house, and I want to take that musket away from you, okay? I'm gonna try and build in some protections like, no, you cannot search and find that material without certain legal authorities, okay, like a warrant, okay, a warrant to conduct a search or you know, conduct a seizure, okay? And another important freedom here, that prosecution, okay, legal prosecution requires the state obey due process of law, okay? That is that I should know the law should operate in a predictable and public fashion. I should know whether or not I'm in danger of being prosecuted. And if people prosecute me, they have certain procedures that they have to follow. Okay? They can't be arbitrary in their exercise of authority. Okay? That, was a, that was one of the important sort of sources of political language in the, in the founding of the United States is the notion of arbitrary authority. Okay? That a monarchical authority is too arbitrary, it is not public. Okay, it does not obey the will of the public. Okay, so in thinking about that as some of the importance for the concept of liberty, okay, in the operation of our country's laws, okay, and to notice the way in which a number of those fundamental civil liberties or our political liberties, okay, are related to questions of surveillance, right? Search, seizure, expression, these are all things that are related to the collection and production of information, to gathering information. They're all, you know, going back a couple hundred years, they are all related to this question of surveillance. Okay. Fundamentally connected. Okay. Surveillance, and this is another way it's connected to political violence, surveillance generates political and military power, generates political and military power, Okay, through an imbalance in information. Through an imbalance in information. Okay. You've probably heard the expression, know your enemy, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. If I know more about you than you know about me, right, that likely puts me in a position of power. Right. If I know what you're doing, if I can anticipate what you'll do, that puts me in a position of power. Okay. One of the ways, one of the themes I have for political violence and sort of this tension between liberty and security, okay, when you go from having a society that is the product of an armed rebellion that is concerned a lot about liberties and political expression, and that society becomes one of the more powerful societies in the world, okay, instead of worrying a lot about the question of rebellion, Okay, and the production of dissent from power, okay, you have a society, I think, that becomes increasingly focused on security, securing what's yours. Okay? It's like, 
If you're already very powerful, if you live in a powerful society as well, okay, chances are you're more interested in, it's like, we've got what we want, now the question is how do we protect it? Okay. Part of the reason that these are in fundamental tension okay, is that the means of generating that protection, the means of generating security, okay, if it's about producing imbalances in information, Okay, knowing more about your enemies than they know about you. Okay, now that's in strong tension with the expression of dissent, right? For one, I gather the information. You know, I'm, I'm the government here. I gather the information and I keep it to myself, right? If I tell you everything that I know, it's no longer imbalanced, right? Suddenly we just all know that information. Okay, so it's not a source of power any, any, anymore, right? And to illustrate a little bit the way in which some of this tension okay, relates to our top thing, okay, picture view, relates to our topic, I want you to look at this picture. I'll, I'll zoom in in a second, okay, but first I want to explain what this picture is. This picture is from a research paper okay, from a sociologist, okay, not, some, not, a, not a Snowden type, not a guy who works with like fancy in, you know, computers in the NSA or anything like that. This is a guy who works at a place like Emory, okay? And went through and applied, he's a sociologist and also a historian, okay? And one of the tools that sociologists and historians are using more and more, okay, is this thing called group analysis. It's like, we'll go back and we'll look and use historical information to try to generate um, a map or sort of an idea about who's in certain groups, okay? Who's in certain groups? How are they connected together, right? If you want to understand how people change the world, you want to understand how society operated, one of the things that you need to know about is how are people connected? So this diagram is a diagram of part of his group analysis of a number of the radical political groups that went into the beginning of the American Revolution. So the Sons of Liberty, as an example, right, the people who did the Boston Tea Party, okay, these are the names, basically, of all of the people that historians know were in that set of groups in New England, okay? And he went through, and through a series of mathematical techniques that are admittedly too complicated for me to understand, but not too complicated for lots and lots of people and academics across the country to understand, okay? He went through, did this diagram, and then pretended, he wrote a, a blog post in which he's like, I'm going to pretend, okay, that we're having this debate about surveillance and metadata in our society, okay? Metadata, just as a brief aside, is data about data. Data about data. So, for instance, when all of you said that Google Maps needs to know where you're, the location of your cell phone, that's metadata, okay? Data about the location, that's, it's information about information. Where is this phone? Not what, not what is on the phone, okay, but where is it, okay? Now, some people have said government surveillance is justified in a lot of the cases that are being discovered right now because it only deals with metadata, okay? It only deals with the location. It doesn't deal with content, right? So I just see who sent emails or who made phone calls. I don't know the content of those phone calls or I don't read the content of those emails. There's some question about whether or not that's true, but we'll accept for a moment that it is, okay, just metadata. This sociologist said, well, tell you what, we have a bunch of metadata about the American revolutionary groups, that is, we know who sent letters to each other, right? Without reading any of the content of those letters, I'm gonna pretend that I'm a British intelligence agent, okay? I'm a spy working for Her Majesty's government, and I'll write a blog post about these nasty American revolutionaries who are gathering weapons to try and overthrow the legitimate government in the colonies. Okay? And through this group analysis, he found that there should be one very particular target that Her Majesty's government should be interested in above all. A person who's at the center of all of these groups, who is well connected through correspondence with all of the people in various radical political organizations. Who? Paul Revere. Her Majesty's government, okay, using only metadata, can say, we should definitely arrest this Paul Revere guy. 
We don't know, we don't know the content of any, of any of his communications. We don't know exactly what he said to any of his radical friends. But we do know that he's connected to all of them. So we should bring him in for questioning. Okay. So I want you to, when I say that there's a fundamental tension between liberty and security, okay, between civil rights or civil liberties and the expression of dissent and the production of national security, I think that this illustrates some of that fundamental tension very well. Our own society was founded by people who, if we applied some of the techniques that our society is currently using to surveil okay, its perceived political opponents, the chances are that the networks that helped generate that society would have been considered legitimate targets for surveillance and it would have been very easy to capture and uh, prosecute most of them. Okay? That is, okay, security policy okay, is usually about the attempt to define and legitimate the authorized use of force, right? Authorized use of force. We're going to figure out who should be subject to violence. We talked about that a little bit before. Okay. In some ways, I would say our society has gone from being composed of people who thought of themselves as potential targets of surveillance Okay, to being an organizer of surveillance on a very, very large scale. Okay. I'm going to talk through some of the history of that and the way in which that history is connected to the pursuit of national security. Okay. But first, why don't we take a, can we take a five, five minute break? Okay, it's about 10.30, I've got a lot of material left. So, Take a, you know, stand up, take a, take a deep breath, whatever, shake out your hands. I know you've, you've been you've great so far listening. When we're at 10.35, five minutes, we'll meet back here. We'll finish up the rest of the, rest of the lecture, okay? You've done a good job of anticipating the next part of the talk. We're going to talk about some ways in which the pursuit of security sometimes undermines civil rights. So yeah, you've already you're you're thinking ahead. I, I like that. We're definitely going to talk about some of the ways in which yeah, it is all using wartime as a way to suppress civil liberties, suppress the civil liberties. So yeah, good job. One more thing, though. You were talking about how like the county calls the liberty and security. I got a story about that. Yeah. No, it's it, it's the solid. I mean, it's like that's that's the heart of the time. Yeah. Heart of the time. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you. Yes. Well, think about it as more like if you're going to do surveillance well, okay, you want it to produce information about who needs particular groups. If you're, let's say you're, let's say it's criminal justice. 